afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to Ship Happens, shipping PRs at scale with the Merge Queue. Uh, my name is Jack Lee, and I am a production engineer at Shopify on the developer acceleration team. So broadly, we commit our time to helping our developers be productive and build the tools and infrastructure um, to help keep them happy. So in case you've never heard of Shopify, Shopify is the leading multi-channel commerce platform that powers more than one million merchants globally. Some of our merchants include the GitHub store. Um, the GitHub shop out front is actually using our POS system. Also Fashion Nova and Kylie Cosmetics, just to name a few. As you can imagine, next week's Black Friday is going to be a fun time for us. So the core of Shopify is built on a large, majestic Ruby on Rails monolith. There are 21,000 files. And we, we run 140 tests every time in CI. You can say we're pretty big. We also follow a trunk-based workflow using pull requests as our unit of work, and we call our trunk branch master. That might sound familiar to some of you. Hundreds of developers work on this monolith daily, and so keeping things productive and moving fast becomes very hard. So today, I'll be talking about the Merge Queue, which is a tool that we created to maintain high velocity of shipping at scale. I also want to share our release philosophy and how that shaped the tooling that we built. So I don't have a fun GitHub action for you guys to take home today and immediately take advantage of all of our work. And I don't even expect most of you to be able to go home and just implement everything I talk about um, tonight. But I do want you to take away the ideas and philosophies behind how we build our tools and challenge us on the parts that don't make any sense. So let's talk about everyone's favorite thing, numbers. We merge 400 commits every day to master. That is a lot of commits, but if you think about it, it's not really that interesting. Maybe we just have a lot of developers, right? They do a lot of work, ends up with a lot of commits. But what is interesting is that we deploy our monolith to production 40 times a day. That means that more than once an hour, we deploy our entire stack to over 1 million global merchants. And most of this happens during the 9 AM to the 5 PM Eastern Time Zone Workday. So at Shopify, we approach shipping a little bit differently than a lot of other companies. Specifically, our most important attribute is throughput. And we need to make sure that we can ship as many pull requests as we can, as fast as we can, but not at the expense of safety. And we can simplify our philosophy to three main rules that guide our shipping principles. The first rule is that master must always be green. So we want to be able to deploy for master at all times. And if master isn't green, then we have to get it back to green as fast as we can. Master should be close to what we run in production. So we believe that no matter how much testing you do, the ultimate test is to see how the changes behave with production traffic and production data. So when we leave things undeployed on master, this increases the risk of the next deploy. Every change becomes another thing that can go wrong. Emergency fixes must be fast. When incidents happen, sometimes we have to ship something immediately to resolve it. Over a million merchants depend on us to keep their stores open. And so when things break, we owe it to our merchants to make the recovery as fast and safe as possible. So let's go back to Shopify 2016. And this was a time where we were starting to get a little big, but things were a bit of the Wild West. And that's perfectly OK. Our developer workflow looked a little bit something like this. So developer go ahead and create a new pull request, increase the stock price by 200%. Wouldn't that be nice? And then we will wait for branch CI. And this is CI that just runs on whatever the state of the branch is. 
In 2016, this took about 15 minutes to run. And eventually it passes. Sweet. We can now merge the master by pressing our favorite button, the merge pull request button. Once this is done, we can deploy to production, right? Nice and easy. Not exactly. So at this point, we were starting to get a little big, and we had lots of developers shipping lots of changes. So while we were waiting for RCI, many others were waiting for theirs as well. And after we merged, they came into master right after us. Now, while each of these pull requests have passed CI individually on their branches, they aren't guaranteed to pass once we actually put them together. But not a problem. To ensure that we can integrate these changes together properly, we can run CI again for each merge commit that ended up in master. And each of those will have their own CI status. And eventually, we're going to get some back, so we get a green over at the top. And another one. And another. So awesome. We just got three green builds in a row. Now at this point, we have a continuous delivery tool called ShipIt, which is an open source tool that we created here at Shopify. And the way that ShipIt works is that it automatically goes ahead and deploys batches of past pull requests out to production. So in this case here, it would see the green statuses, and it would automatically craft a batch of all of the undeployed commits up to the last green. And it will go ahead and deploy them to production. We do perform canary deploys and multiple deploy steps, but for sake of simplicity, I'm just going to group the whole thing as production. And then after the first deploy we send out, we get the next two pull requests to pass as well. No problem. Ship is going to go ahead, package those up, and deploy those out to production as well. And this helps make it so that we don't need to coordinate deploys. And instead, all of this stuff happens automatically. Every developer is responsible for monitoring their deploy that contains the pull, their pull requests and ensuring that it deploys and works properly. And then once everything's deployed, we're done. Nice and easy. Unfortunately, though, things don't always go this smoothly. The first problem we have is with conflicts. And I'm not talking about hard conflicts where you're, you and someone else are changing the same line of code, but I'm talking about soft conflicts, which are much harder to detect. These are changes that might pass CI independently, but they'll fail once they're put together. So let's go back to the previous example over here. And we have two pull requests that have passed at this point, and two more that are still pending. Let's assume that the next CI status comes back as failed. Uh-oh. But how can this happen if it already passed the branch CI? So the first answer is maybe it wasn't rebased properly. Maybe the branch it was based off of was master from last week. That could have caused it. Or maybe this can happen because of saw conflicts. So maybe 414 or 415 over there introduced some change that conflicted logically with 416, causing it not to pass when it's built together. And because 416 has broken the build, everything else after it would fail as well. Now, this is not the end of the world. We can still make some progress. So at this point, ship is going to go along and see, OK, so I have some passes. Sorry. Um, and so we can still deploy the first batch. But after we do that, unfortunately, we get stuck. And to make matters worse, other people might not realize that master is broken right now, and they're going to continue merging. So at this point, we don't just have one or two failed pull requests, but we now have a train of 10 failed pull requests that we can't deploy. And eventually, you know, the author is responsible, and they notice that their change has broken master. And they're going to go ahead and merge a de uh, revert that goes on top of the, the, uh, the stack, which passes. But we can't deploy any commit between 415 over there and the revert. So when we do go ahead and deploy, we end up deploying this gigantic batch of 11 pull requests out to production. That's not very nice. And this brings us to our second problem. 
which is master drifting from production. So every time a conflict shows up, master ends up further and further ahead of what is running in production right now. And we call this phenomenon drift. And it substantially increases the risk of the next deployment. If this last batch deploys and something goes wrong, we now have 11 potential pull requests that could have caused the problem. In practice, this number is even larger due to how fast our, progress, our developers ship their pull requests. So to in, in order to ensure that we can deploy safely, we have to control this drift to make sure the master is never too far ahead of production. But really, this is the problem even if all of our builds pass. This is because we deploy everything in batches. But what happens if something breaks and we need to ship something to production right now? We can go ahead and merge our emergency fix, but again, it ends up at the top of master. And we run into the same problem. We can't deploy fast enough, and now we have to go ahead and deploy a large batch of changes to go out just so the emergency fix can make its way out. Now, we've just introduced a lot of risk, and after an emergency fix, it's possible that one of the other 10 pull requests might have introduced a different problem. And now we are in a cycle where we're constantly fixing new failures. So a fun bit of history about Shopify. Every year, we do something called, called a code freeze in the week leading up to Black Friday. This is to ensure that our systems are stable during the busiest time of the year, and merchants don't have their tools changing out from under them. But on the next Tuesday, we have to merge all of the changes that developers have been working on during the code freeze. And in order to coordinate this without flooding master, again, to prevent drift, we ask developers to add their pull requests to a milestone, and then we will go ahead and we will slowly merge the pull requests and make sure they come out in safe batches. This was 2016. So the next year, we did not want to do that again. And our solution was to build the first iteration of what we call the merge queue. So the first thing that changes with this approach is that now developers add their pull requests to a queue rather than going directly into master. We created a Chrome extension that adds this Add to Merge Queue button to every single pull request so that the experience feel, feels familiar to the GitHub experience. And when that button is pressed, the PR gets added to a queue in a system that we maintain. And just like in the previous case, Everyone else can merge their pull requests as well, and they'll end up in the same queue. Now, once we have some items in the queue, we will go ahead and slowly merge everything to master using the GitHub API. The benefit of this intermediate queue, though, is that we're able to now programmatically control the flow of merges going into master. So the control looks at master in production, and if master starts to get too far ahead, it will actually pause the merging. So let's say that we have a queue, and we want a maximum drift of three, which means that we don't ever want to have more than three undeployed pull requests sitting in master. The merge queue here is going to merge three of the pull requests to master and let the other two sit in the queue. And once the pull requests get merged, that is when we start master CI. So this part uses the same logic as the previous solution, where we go ahead and run CI once it's emerged, and things will start deploying to production once this CI succeeds. Now, one very useful feature of this merge queue is the ability to lock or pause merges temporarily. So let's think back to the emergency case. If an emergency pull request needs to go out right now, we can make sure that it can go out in isolation or with very little other changes. And this helps mitigate risk. And this very simple mechanism worked very well, and it gave us a lot of control over the rate in which we were merging to master. Unfortunately, it wasn't perfect, and it did have some drawbacks. 
The first drawback was it was just really slow. So let's go back to the previous example for a second, where we had just merged three pull requests to master. Now, while we wait for master CI on the three pull requests that we merged, the other pull requests are sitting in the queue, basically in limbo. And if we assume that our CI takes 30 minutes to run, this means that the authors of 417 and 418 over there have to wait 30 minutes before CI even starts on their pull requests. There's also no guarantee that after they wait those 30 minutes and they merge to master, that CI would pass after that. So it could take up to an hour in this case just for them to find out that they had an issue. And if you're later down in the queue, there's more pull requests in there, you would have to wait even longer. An hour and a half, two hours, three hours, you never know. And the second problem was that we had this browser extension now that we had to maintain. So while the browser extension gave us a nice way to hook into the GitHub UI, it did come with a bag of its own issues. New developers who don't have the extension installed would end up merging to master directly by accident, skipping the line. Now, in theory, we could have disabled the ability to press the merge button at all. But at the same time, we wanted to keep that option available for emergencies. The UI here was also a little bit difficult to extend. And adding new features was non-trivial. And that made it hard to build on top of. An example is we would have no way of adding it to the GitHub app that we just announced yesterday. So this year, we went back to the drawing board. And we shipped the second iteration of the merge queue to address the shortcomings of the first version. We call this one the v2. The first thing we did was we moved to a new way of interaction with the queue using comments. So in every pull request, developers are greeted by a message from our bot. And that bot gives some simple instructions on how to use the queue. And when developers are ready to ship their pull request, they can issue the slash ship it comment to the pull request. We'll go ahead, receive the webhook, and we'll run a few basic checks. We want to make sure that branch CI has passed and that reviewers have approved the pull request. And if the checks pass, we go ahead and add the pull request to a queue, and we throw in a little thumbs up emoji to give some feedback. If the checks fail, we will go ahead and add a comment to the pull request explaining the problem. So our new pipeline now looks a little bit like this. Slash ship it on a pull request now adds it to our new merge queue. But at the same time, we're now doing something smart with the internals of the queue as well. So let's zoom in on that a little bit. So here I have the inside of the second merge queue. Inside of this queue, we've created something called a predictive branch, which is kind of a fancy way of saying that we now have a sort of virtual candidate for what master could be. And we base this off of the current master, and we let's go ahead and save it in GitHub as a branch. So let's assume that master right now is pointed to a commit with SHA 000000, just for simplicity. And as pull requests get added to the queue, we go ahead and we create merge commits on this predicted branch using the merge branch GraphQL mutation for those pull requests. And by creating this, we actually are able to now have a branch that we can use to run CI. So as more things get added to the queue, we can create merge commits for each of those pull requests as well. And each of those in the queue would have their own CI status. So what this does for us is that it allows us to run master CI inside of the merge queue rather than waiting for it to be merged to master first. The predictive branch helps us uh, serve as a possibility of what master could be, but it still allows us the flexibility to continue to make changes to the branch, such as removing something from the queue or changing the order. So if we take a step out of the merge queue for a second, the end product looks something like this. Pull requests get added to the queue, 
And now each of the pull requests in the queue have a CI status before they even hit master. Now let's assume that we get some passing builds. Sweet. We all like to see that. Oops. Sorry, went a little ahead. Um, doo -doo -doo. Um, so how do we get this stuff onto master? So this time, instead of going ahead and merging branches and stuff into master, we're going to instead fast forward our master branch to point to the last green merge commit. So notice over here, master one from 000, and pointed directly to the SHA of the last passing pull request merge commit, which is BBB, BBB. And this allows us to preserve the predictive branch, ensuring that we don't throw away any of the in-progress CI builds. And it also gives us a way to preserve all the statuses that were set on those merge commits that we created earlier. And just like in the previous merge queue, we're still able to control the flow of changes to master. The new merge queue works very well when we need to lock the queue during incidents. So in these cases, we can merge things to master, but we can still make progress on CI. So in this case, the queue was locked, but CI comes back green for our commits. The queue is still locked, so we can't merge anything, but that's OK, because once things get unlocked, we can go ahead and ship those changes immediately. So problem gets fixed. The lock is green. And we can go ahead and immediately fast forward those commits into master and have them start deploying. Here's a graph of the merge queue size after we launched the new merge queue. So the first vertical line you see is when the queue got locked for an incident. You can kind of see after the lock happened, the queue starts growing because of the pull requests that our developers have been adding to the merge queue. At the second red line, the queue gets unlocked, and immediately we can go ahead, drain, and merge all of those pull requests into master and have them start deploying right away. Now, what happens when CI fails? So obviously, we want to make sure that we can always have green commits to fast forward to, which means that we also have to get rid of the failures that we see. So we got some builds here. And let's assume that we have two passing builds, which is nice. But 416 here fails its, fails its CI. So since we have a failing build here, we should probably remove 416 from the queue because we don't want anything else after it to start failing as well. Unfortunately, it's not so simple. In our case here, removals become very expensive. Because if we remove a pull request from the queue, it means that the structure of the entire branch changes. And so we actually have to throw away all of the work for all of the uh, pull requests behind it. Also, a single CI failure could be a very bad signal. It's possible to have infrastructure issues with CI. We've all seen those. Maybe flaky tests. So it's not guaranteed um, sorry. Yeah. So in this case over here, we, we don't know for sure if this is even breaking anything. We're also not guaranteed that it's going to block later builds from passing. So the simple solution that we went with was to introduce a concept called the failure tolerance. And this is a configurable per repo value that basically says, how many successive failures do you need before you kick something out from the queue? In our example here, we can assume a failure tolerance of two, which we can show using the red line. This means that we can tolerate two failures, but on the third failure, we're going to go ahead and eject 416 from the queue. So let's see what happens. We get a second failure. Starting to get a little close, but we're still OK. But now we see a third failure. So because 416 has now exceeded that failure tolerance, we're going to go ahead and remove it from the queue. And in this case here, because we removed something from the queue, we now reset the CI status for everything behind it. And you'll notice that the SHA has changed as well, because we have to go ahead and create new merge commits 
for those pull requests. In this case, if the third build passed instead of failing, we would have kept the tree as is. So emergency merges. So sometimes, just like before, we have an incident, and we need to ship something out immediately. To do this, we created a special command called slash ship it dash dash emergency. And this functions just like the default merge pull request button. By issuing this command, we're going to go ahead and merge that pull request directly into master. And once that pull request lands on master, it's going to go ahead and start its own CI. At this point, developers can, wait, can decide if they want to wait for that CI to finish or if they want to just go ahead and deploy immediately. This command helps codify th the cases for merging directly as being reserved for emergencies only, and it also lets us audit how often this command gets used and why. So as an example, let's assume that our tree looks like this again, just like in the previous example. And this time, uh-oh, we got a problem. So something has broken production, and now there's exceptions everywhere. But don't worry, this is fine. A fix gets created for the production problem, and we can go ahead and slash ship it dash dash emergency to land it directly into master. So over here, the master shot changes, and CI starts for the commit we just merged in. And now, because master has changed, our predictive branch has now diverged and is no longer compatible with the current master. So what this means is we have to go ahead and create a new one and reset CI for everything in the queue. So even though it's possible to ship things during emergencies, it now becomes a very disruptive process. So we have a lot of things happening now under the hood of the new merge queue. We have emergency fixes. We have removals of failing PRs. And there's a lot of things that can affect others. So how do developers actually know what's going on with the state of their pull request? So throughout the whole process, we communicate everything through GitHub checks. So there's a status set on every pull request. And clicking into the details page will give feedback on the state of their changes in the queue, their CI statuses, as well as the history of what happened to the pull request as it's been going through the queue. So to summarize, we can take a look at some of the wins that the second merge queue gave us, as well as some trade-offs. The first win is controlled updates to master. So we're able to now prevent master from drifting too far from production because we can continue to limit the rate in which we merge our pull requests. Evergreen master. So since we are only forwarding to commits with passing builds, master will only ever go from passing state to passing state. This helps local development, so developers will never pull a failing master and will never have to coordinate fixing the master build ever again. CI before merge. So because we now build CI in the queue, we can continue making progress even without things explicitly landing in master. And this gives us higher throughput in times when the queue is locked or when master is getting too far ahead. Automatic removal of failed PRs from the queue. So now we don't need humans to notice our problems. And instead, we can go ahead and message offending authors directly using robots. This means less work for developers as a whole. And there's also no more stress that the author is holding everyone up. For some trade-offs, removing a PR from the queue now resets CI statuses. So we talked a little bit about that. Removing is now very disruptive. For now, we're OK with this trade-off, since breakages are still fairly uncommon. But if too many removals happen, this, the queue will start on dramatically, and we have to revisit this problem. And skipping the queue resets our CI statuses. So same problem as the previous trade-off. The main case here is emergency merges. And they are very disruptive because they reset CI for everyone. So what's next? So obviously, we want to address some of the trade-offs that our current solution has. And one of the things we're thinking about is this idea called parallel trees. 
So right now, the reason why we have a lot of the shortcomings that we have is because we have a single predictive branch at any given time. But what if we implement a parallel tree approach where we build multiple realities of what master could be? So in this example here, we had the five pull requests we were talking about earlier. And we have one tree that includes all five of them. And then we build five additional trees where each of those additional trees is missing one of the pull requests out of the first five. So we call this the one level of exclusion, where basically we're saying that at most, only one PR will be broken at a time. In the most ideal world, we would actually build one tree for every permutation of pull requests in our queue. But as you can imagine, this Carnati skyrockets, and it's kind of hard to fit onto a slide. So in this example over here, if we assume that pull request 414 introduces a breakage, then we're going to be OK, because we have a tree here that didn't include 414. And so it will be successful when every other tree fails. This makes it so that if there is a problem, we can still make progress. Now, we did try running this model in production for about a few days. And we realized that even with this only one level of exclusion, we were incurring too much load. So going to the next year, we want to find a way to do this that's smart and cheaper for us to run. Faster CI. So we're also thinking about making CI faster, because, well, that's kind of the part that's bounding us right now. If we can make CI faster, then the worst cases in our system won't be as bad and everything becomes faster as a whole. So spoiler, we do have a team working internally on this problem. Um, specifically, they're looking at running a subset of our test suite each time instead of the whole thing. But we're still pretty early into this, and so we don't have anything yet, but we will share our findings when we can. So earlier today, we did release a more technical blog post to our engineering blog about the design of the actual queue we built. And if you want to learn more about what we're doing, what we have done, check out our engineering blog at engineering.shopify.com. And to be honest, it's been hard for us to find other solving problems in this space and scale. But if that does sound like you, let's talk. So me and my colleagues, Darren and Willem, over there, um, are here uh, all day. And so please come find us, and we'd love to chat and compare notes with you. Other than that, thank you for the privilege of your time, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.